The Feudal Future Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have two eminent guests to talk about the role of third party part third party politics in the upcoming election. First, we have Professor John Compton, who is chair of the political science department at Chapman University. His specialty is the role of religion in politics, and his book, The End of Empathy, by by Oxford University Press, is a, a tremendous work in this area. And we're joined by Mike Barone, longtime pundit and observer of American politics, senior fellow at American Enterprise Institute, and author of The Almanac of American Politics. Gentlemen, welcome. Well, thank Thanks you. for having me. Joel, you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, the f- first question is, we have the possibility of several um, third-party candidacies. Do you think it's going to have any impact? I mean, we're, we're in an election where you have arguably the worst choices for president in, uh, in a century. Will third parties make a difference, or are they still marginal? Well... Uh, I, sh- I should add to your generous introduction that I'm the senior political analyst at the Washington Examiner uh, these days. And um, yeah, I think there's a potential impact. I mean, you have something like 20 percent of the electorate are uh, composed of uh, what some pundit called double haters. People <laughs> would have negative feelings towards the 45th president, Donald Trump, and negative feelings towards the 46th president, uh, Joe Biden. And so, uh, you know, there's there's the possibility of, uh, of of people migrating to a third party candidate of casting protest votes. Um, it's a little hard to see how uh, you could have a, a a candidate who could be competitive in the national popular vote or in determining the uh, electoral vote of, uh, you know, winning the electoral votes of a particular state. Um, But there's certainly the possibility for a significant migration of votes, maybe as large as uh, the 19 percent that ended up voting for Ross Perot in 1992, um, even after he uh, said that uh, he had left the campaign for a while because the Bush was sending in the Air Force to strafe his daughter's wedding. (laughs) <laughs> uh, before we get, I would like to get John's take, but when you mentioned the impact on the, on the electorate, you're originally from Michigan. That seems to be the place where the third party issue might become a determinant. I mean, you well, know more about Michigan than I do. <laughs> well, people have uh, taken a look at the fact that there's a large Arab American population and there's uh, a large group of people who uh uh, are of Palestinian descent or may identify themselves as such a uh, larger percentage in Michigan than other states. It's not a huge percentage of the state. You're talking about 2% or something mm-hmm. of the state's population. Uh, you also have uh, as mainstays of the Democratic Party in Michigan these days, big university towns. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you look at the highest, you know, what's the county in Michigan that has the high? the significant county that has the highest Democratic percentage in the last election. Well, it's not Wayne County, the home of Detroit and the old industrial uh, things, the headquarters of the United Auto Workers and so forth. It's Washtenaw County, the home of the University of Michigan, Mm. uh, Western Eastern Michigan University, and of a whole lot of people that find the ambiance of a university town uh, congenial. And those people tend to be on the political left. Uh, they may have some grievances with Joe Biden, in particular over the uh, policy with respect to Gaza and Israel, uh, but also possibly on other issues. And they may be in the market for another candidate. So, um, and Michigan's not the only state where university counties have been a mainstay of the Democratic vote. Uh, there's vulnerability in other places, too, uh, including in Minnesota, which has the Somali population, but also a big university community in the University of Minnesota in uh, in, in Minneapolis. 
Uh, John, what's what's your sense of this? What what what's the role of third parties going to be in the upcoming election? Yeah, I think there's two ways of of thinking about that question. And you know, on the one hand, this election is likely to be very close in terms of the popular vote. I'd be shocked if uh, you know there was more than three or four points separating Trump and Biden at the end of the day. And from that perspective, third parties could be very important, right? I mean, the the reason we still remember Ralph Nader and you know his Green Party bid in 2000 is because that election was very close, not because Ralph Nader got a huge share of the vote. Um, and something like that could could very easily happen again this year, particularly when you think about you know the very limited number of states that are going to be really competitive and consequential in the electoral college. So, from that perspective, um, you know RFK's bid could make a big difference, for example. Um, but thinking of it, you know, in the big picture, in terms of a vote share, I'd be I'd be really shocked if if our RFK or any other um, third party candidate approaches uh, Ross Perot's total from 1992. I mean, I'd personally be surprised if anyone, you know, if RFK or, or whoever gets five percent of the vote or, or more than five percent of the vote, because I think at the end of the day, the, the electorate is very polarized, and when push comes to shove. You know, you have a lot of kind of low information Democrats who may not like Joe Biden and may be expressing support for Kennedy in the polls. But I just I have to think when push comes to shove that the two parties are going to get the bulk of the vote share, which is not going to leave a ton left for third party candidates. The One of the things I, um, I found interesting is I thought the RFK candidacy was certainly intriguing but it just seems that since he's now uh, selected an ATM as vice president, um, that do you think that that is a sign of the, the, his weakness and inability to come up with any kind of consistent message? I mean, the vice presidential well, choice was bizarre beyond belief. Well, it's, um, gee, I, I don't know if Nicole Shanahan would appreciate you saying that, Joe, but uh, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not rich enough to be of interest to her. Well, the question, uh, you know, he hasn't gotten on many statewide uh, state ballots as yet. Uh, and of course, that can be a money intensive uh, operation. Uh, and so uh, having a vice presidential candidate who can write checks in more or less an unlimited amount is obviously an asset. You, you, It's been happened before. The Libertarian Party in 1980 nominated a man for president, Ed Clark. But the real ATM for that machine was uh, David Koch, one of the Koch brothers, not recently deceased, um, who was uh, nominated as their vice presidential candidate and basically financed uh, their campaign uh, that didn't affect the outcome. But, uh, you know, it's uh, RFK does not have regional base like mm-hmm. some candidates, uh, third party candidates, George Wallace, mm-hmm. who got. Uh, electoral votes from a number of states, 13% of the national vote, um, but uh, did not send the election into the House of Representatives, although you can make hypotheticals changing just a few votes and get that result in 1968. Uh, you have Bob La Follette in 1924 carries Wisconsin, comes close to carrying Minnesota, North Dakota, the old uh, Germans, Germano Scandinavian America, as I call it. Um, but was not dispositive because Calvin Coolidge won that election by a wide margin. Um, but, uh, you know, the real question is, can, can an RFK Jr. Uh, be a major factor in, uh, as, as Theodore Roosevelt was, and knows out one of the major party candidates uh, for the number two position? Uh, Theodore Roosevelt won 88 electoral votes in 1912, he came pretty close to winning about 180. I did a little exercise of that the other day. I came within a few percent, uh, but would even if he had done so, he would not have defeated the Democratic nominee Woodrow Wilson in that three presidents race uh, where former President Roosevelt uh, was running against pres- incumbent President Taft and future President Wilson. Um, that was. You know, could RFK Jr. do something like that? Uh, Absent some um, disqualifying health factor or either of the two candidates, uh, major party candidates, I don't I think the answer is no. Well, that's a tactful way of saying it. The some disqualifying health (laughs) 
uh, event. The the question I would have is, what is the thread of discontent that would be driving a move at all toward a third party? And is it, in fact, age and health related? Well, it's certainly an age problem uh, on the part of Joe Biden. There's no question about that. People see him as a uh, as as a person who is uh, really too old for the job, uh, we just had death, tragic death, in my view of uh, Senator Joe, former Senator Joe Lieberman, who was uh, born in the same year as Joe Biden, some months earlier, um, at the age of eighty-two after a fall, which uh, reminds us that somebody who was very active in the political process, who was part of this no labels group, which was contemplating a third party candidate, uh, candidacy, um, had a health incident and is uh, sadly no longer with us. So uh, you have uh, Mr. Uh, Biden at 81, Donald Trump will turn, what, 78 in, uh, in, uh, in, in June. And um, it's, uh, you know, those of us who remember that Jim Ronald Reagan was thought to be too old to seek another term at age 73, mm -hmm. uh, he would have been a young whippersnapper <laughs> to uh, the two major party nominees. But is it is it age that is driving the move toward um, third party interest at all, John? Or is it some other factor in the American zeitgeist that has people uh, upset? Yeah, I mean, I think on the Democratic side, it's largely age. Um, you know, and if you look at the current polls, which are kind of all over the place in terms of third party support, you know, uh, Kennedy's numbers are like, you know, ranging from 5% to, you know, the high teens in some polls. And if you look at who's backing him, it seems to be kind of low information Democrats or people who are you know, not happy with Biden for various reasons and maybe not super familiar with RFK Jr., but they know the Kennedy name. Um, I think that's kind of what may explain the, um, the strong poll numbers. And again, I think that may fade. Uh, but on the bigger question of when third party movements really tend to get rolling, I think, you know, there are kind of two ways it can happen. One is if there's some movement uh, or issue that's that's not being addressed by the two parties, um, some issue they don't want to touch or some position they don't want to take. Um, you know, we mentioned George Wallace a second ago. That was certainly the case with, with you know, neither party wanting to come out strongly against civil rights in 1968. There was a constituency for a candidate to do that. Um, but the other time, I think the, the other way that a third party movement can have success in a presidential year is sometimes it's the opposite situation where both um, both parties are, are you know fairly uh, uh, where, where voters don't see that much difference between the two parties, and I think that's more what we saw in 1992 with Ross Perot, where you know um, Clinton and George H. W. Bush were both reasonably popular. Voters didn't see huge differences between the two, and so they felt kind of safe and in uh, uh, rolling the dice on Ross Perot. Um, you know, this year, not the case. Both parties are, both nominees are relatively unpopular, comparatively unpopular in, in a historical perspective. Um, so, but at the same time, the country's very polarized. And that's why I think at the end of the day, some of this, uh, you know, some of the strong polling numbers you're seeing for RFK, and other potential third party bids are going to fade. I think people will come back to their their parties at the end of the day. Is no labels now a dead issue? Is that something that's not going to happen? Oh well, I've got uh, I've I've got email in my inbox which I haven't read from Nancy Jacobs and the head of mm -hmm. uh, no labels. Uh, it, it seems like they haven't been able to find a candidate and. Uh, uh, you know, this number of people that were suggested, former Governor Larry Hogan of Maryland, he's running for the U.S. Senate as a, as a Republican instead. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's not clear they're going to find a candidate who's well known. Um, and, you, you know, it's I think that the no labels uh, movement has tended to uh look for a candidate that is uh, more conservative on economic issues, more liberal on cultural issues. Uh, and that, uh, if you divide the electorate into four, ca uh, four quadrants based on 
their different views on cultural and, and economic issues. Um, that quadrant called uh, liberal on uh, cultural issues, conservative on economic issues, is the smallest quadrant in terms of mm. number of voters that fall in there on the basis of their attitudes. Uh, I think um, Star FK Jr. and to a lesser extent, perhaps Cornell West, if he becomes a, a it's ballot access, the green candidate, Jill Stein, um, they're, you know, have the potential of campaigning on uh, environmental issues. We heard Robert F. Kennedy Jr. talk about that he's for banning um, flat fracking entirely. Uh, well, I regard that as kind of a crazy issue, and the the, the uh, Biden administration, which has been going to uh, a considerable extent, including their latest EPA ruling uh, designed to get us uh, all to drive electric vehicle, electric cars. Uh, by 2032, or two thirds of the new car sales to be electric cars, um, but they haven't gone so far as to uh, ban fracking. So there's always environmental issues that uh, uh, a candidate like Kennedy, Glenn, can raise and uh, and and raise, you know, and, and that's at least some groups of uh, what John was talking about: the low informational, perhaps young. Uh, tilted towards the young age group of potential Democratic voters may say, hey, uh, instead of voting for this old guy, we'll vote for the comparatively youthful RFK Jr., who actually is 70 years old himself. (laughs) Um, That leads me to this other part of the quadrant, which may be bigger, which is people who may be economically more liberal, but socially more conservative. And John, that's your area of study. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's always astounding to me how many evangelicals support a moral reprobate like uh, like Donald Trump. What do you, is there any potential for for that group, or do you think that Trump owns them? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think we've kind of entered a, an era when politics is driving a lot of religion rather than religion driving politics, and. You know, I think at this point, Trump has a pretty firm hold on the evangelical vote. I mean, I I think a lot of people maybe misremember how things unfolded in 2016. And initially, there was a lot of opposition to Trump in the evangelical community. You had a lot of prominent evangelicals who came out against him and obviously others, you know, Jerry Falwell Jr., the now disgraced Jerry Falwell Jr., uh, (laughs) supported him. Uh, But there was initially a lot of opposition. But then when Trump got the nomination, everyone fell in line. You know, he famously won 83 percent of the evangelical vote. And, you know, I really don't see any signs of that changing, particularly, uh, you know, as long as Democrats don't radically change their stance on social issues, which seems very unlikely. Uh, I think Trump pretty well has that that constituency locked up. Um, are, are we in a, you know, it's funny you should talk about that because the sense that I get is that both parties are going to an unusual degree compared to previous elections of pandering to these um, highly specialized points of view, whether it's an evangelical point of view, whether it's a DEI point of view, whether it's a ecologically driven point of view, there's more pandering that's going on without any substantive real support underneath it for the particular particular point of view. Uh, what's your sense? Is, is this happening more frequently in today's society than it has in the past? What do you guys think? Well, I, I, you know, it's a, there's a certain fluidity in the issues landscape. Uh, Joe Biden who in his candidacy in 2020 seemed to be premised on the idea that he was kind of a centrist bridge between generations of Democrats and the guy who grew up in blue-collar Scranton uh, has been pretty left-wing on uh, most of the cultural issues uh, and and so forth, including uh, trans issues where, if you look at public opinion polls, he's very much in the minority on uh, and so forth. His administration has got, you know, has taken the, what I consider to be the preposterous position that that uh, biological men who identify as women should be able to participate in women's sports, uh, where they have obvious advantages that uh, 
uh, we've seen demonstrated uh, in a number of venues. Um, and, you know, is Donald Trump's uh, stance on issues uh, uh, permanent or is it, uh, is he, you know, can he wobble on these? Well, in the abortion issue, for example, he's made statements which the right to life people might not necessarily like. His pledge to support uh, people supported by uh, Leonard Leo, the Federalist Society, uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't know if that's still operative or not. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, it, he, you know, he, he has a long history of taking a variety of stands on issues. Um, but, uh, you know, his constituency mostly uh, doesn't seem to care. I mean, one of the arguments for Ron DeSantis uh, in the Republican primaries was, look, Donald Trump talks about doing things, but didn't get a lot of these things done when he was president. Like, didn't build the wall with Mexico completely and so forth. Uh, DeSantis has shown in Florida as governor the capacity to follow through and do things and take command of a bureau- government bureaucracy and make it fulfill the promises. Um, that argument was went over like a lead balloon with Republican primary voters. They just didn't buy it. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, basically, uh, the man I, I would give credit for Donald Trump's primary, uh, victories, uh, besides Trump himself, uh, is Alvin Bragg, the district attorney of New York County in Manhattan, who, uh, indicted him on March 30th, just about a year from the, uh, taping of this uh, podcast uh, uh, for uh, what turns out to be, you know, a pretextual crime that was uh, an an astonishingly weak thing. Uh, At that point, the polling showed Trump 15 points ahead of DeSantis with Trump under 50 percent and DeSantis at 29 percent. Looked like it could be a race that could be seriously contested within a couple of weeks. The next round of polls were taken. Trump's lead was 32 points. He was well over 50 percent. He was renominated. So Alvin Bragg, who was nominated by the Democratic Party to be Manhattan District Attorney by 8,828 votes in 2021, uh, may have determined the certainly determined the outcome of the Republican primary and may have determined the outcome of the presidency because I think what are considered to be um, unjustified, uh, pretextual, pros- unfair prosecutions of Donald Trump uh, are what has really uh, cemented the loyalties of an awful lot of Republican voters to him, uh, leave less room for a third-party candidate uh, as the, among discontented Republicans than perhaps exists in uh, on the other, on the left, of discontented Democrats. You know, the, the irony, uh, John, is that the title of your book is The End of Empathy. And what Mike is saying is it was the empathy for tr- for Trump's uh, uh, travails that actually put him over the top. Uh, what's your sense of this? Are we out of issue land now? Is this just not a factor? You know, I'm a big fan of the political science research that suggests that people, most voters don't have really coherent or well thought out issue positions that they consistently apply when they're casting their ballots. Um, A lot of times people are drawn to a candidate or party for, you know, identity reasons or other reasons they can't fully articulate. And, uh, you know, their their explanations of their votes might talk about issues, uh, but Really, it's just this more, um, you know, innate attachment that they feel to a particular candidate. And I think that's certainly what we see with with Trump. Um, You know, Trump's an example of a candidate who doesn't, you know, you could say has a couple of core positions. He's kind of anti-free trade. He's kind of isolationist on foreign policy. But otherwise, his his positions are either extremely vague or just all over the map. And he'll he'll change on a dime, like with his TikTok ban reversal <laughs> which may have may or may not have been money related um, right until they gave him options of the company and then he was right. suddenly very much no, exactly I'm just and uh, well essentially it's something along those lines and but but 
none of that really matters a lot to voters who who like Trump. They like they like him. They like you know they like his style. They like it that he really sticks it to the Democrats. Um, and I, I think in that sense we really are beyond issues. Um, just to broaden it out a little bit on the, this discussion of you know how much issues matter and pandering to different groups. Um, my pet theory or my pet way of framing it, and I'm probably not the first person to say this, but I, I think that the uh, you know. Democrats kind of have an activist problem and the Republicans kind of have a base problem in that, you know, Republicans have uh, Republicans at the elite level have issues they care about, policies they want to advance. Um, but they have a base that's just deeply, deeply attached to one candidate who can't really seem to focus enough on anything, any one particular issue to actually advance policy. Democrats, on the other hand, have staked out positions, particularly on cultural issues that are not really consistent with the base of the party. If you look at, you know, pulling on policing or, you know, mentioned trans issues earlier, the the party's official stance or the stance of the Biden administration is on a lot of these issues not in line with, say, the average or median um, Democratic voter. Um, so I think the parties have two separate issues, but in both cases, we're in a kind of weird environment where, um, you know, issues and, and, and voting preferences don't connect in quite the same way they did in the past. Well, if you look at that spread of thought, right, of the, what you just brought up, where it would be even the room for a third party candidate to be in people's heads? I mean, I think about Teddy Roosevelt in the Bull Moose era, right? There was kind of a, a uh, there was a, a policy-related issue going on. If and you look he was at a our, very charismatic figure too. Yeah, and if, if yeah. you look at if you look at the um, you know the the Perot dissatisfaction period, there was dissatisfaction with the status quo. If you look at the libertarians, um, there was dissatisfaction with the status quo. Where is the headspace today for an RFK? What 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 piece of real estate mentally does he does he stake out that would actually give them a shot. I think maybe the initial rationale, so far as I could tell, was it was the, you know, he has this strong reputation as a anti-vaccination person, very skeptical of the medical establishment. Um, and maybe this was, I think, a little bit similar to what the rationale for DeSantis's campaign was at the beginning, but the idea that Trump was too hawkish on COVID and there might be space for someone there who, uh, who, uh, you know, it was very anti-lockdown or anti-vaccines or whatever. Um, but that seems to have faded a little bit. You don't, you don't see much. I mean, you know, we know that Trump dispatched DeSantis pretty easily, and, and we don't see much discussion of, of RFK in that context anymore. At least he doesn't seem to be building a big following along those lines. Um, because, as, you know, as we mentioned earlier, I think it's more kind of disaffected low information or younger Democrats who might be backing him. Um, so I'm skeptical of really that there is any space for uh, for anyone to build a viable, any issue space for anyone to build a viable third party candidacy. Yeah, Mike, what do you think about that? Is there is there a, a space that, that RFK could stake out that has any hope of uh, having enough appeal, and, appeal and to do something? That, that's with the assumption that no labels is not happening. Right. Well, the, the, the space, I suppose, is the is more, that's the uh, weaknesses that are personal to each of the two major party candidates. Uh, Biden it, you know, is too old. And in addition, there's the, uh, you know, the, he unleashed inflation or so it could be argued, uh, on people on an American electorate, um, which, uh, everybody under 40 had never experienced a uh, significant inflation in the past as some of an acceleration of inflation. They don't like it, uh, just as they didn't like it in the 1970s. <laughs> so, um, there's a weakness there. Trump uh, is uh, arguably erratic and difficult. I think if you go back to '92, um, when the, the you know the 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 Ross Perot candidacy, you had a weakness on the part of each of the two major party candidates. George, the first George Bush, I think, pretty much achieved all that he set out to achieve in his first term, and at age 68. Uh, was ready to retire, and the voters gave him his wish, and he settled mm -hmm. into a very dignified, uh, constructive retirement period without great regrets that he wasn't getting uh, a second term. Uh, Bill Clinton was uh, relatively young, relatively untested, not known nationally, and 
you know, floundered and made some mistakes during his campaign and during his first years as president. Um, he later learned from those mistakes and emerged as a much stronger candidate to, for real by the re-election time in 1996 and when the impeachment charges came up. But there was perhaps an opening there for a guy like Ross Perot, a you know a billionaire with a lot of name identification. Um, but it's harder to do it as a third party. And I think we have Donald Trump, who in 2016 could have done the third party thing. Mm. Uh, he could have run uh, that, and I, why didn't he do so? I think the answer is that, you know, he had threatened to do so a number of times. Uh, he wasn't strongly linked to either party or had some links to both of them. Uh, why didn't he do it? I think he saw the Perot uh, situation, and he said, that's not the way to win. Uh, you know, he was a billionaire with high name identification, and he said, uh, take one of the major party nominations and uh, and go to town with it. And, uh, you know, uh, I can argue that that was not a good, smart thing for him to do. Uh, but he might say, as a number of uh, presidents have said to political reporters and said they didn't do the right thing, the president would say, uh, Michael, how many times have you been elected president of the United States? <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I won. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> yes, and uh, well, I was elected. Donald Trump would say twice, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, and I think that that assertion that he was the real winner gave him an advantage in the primary season of being of what uh, an incumbent president usually has in seeking re- uh, seeking another nomination for another term an advantage where they basically said, we're loyal to our guy. Yeah. Uh, and that was one of the things that was working for him uh, to an extent that was greater than I had anticipated and shows that Donald Trump, uh, for all his malapropisms and vulgar language and so forth, is actually a little bit better political strategist than I am. Yeah, well, and it engendered that empathy that we talked about, right? The, the empathy with his victim role. Joel, you want to, uh, as we get a little close to our wrap up here, do you want to uh, go for the last question? Yeah, I, I think what, what I'd like to get a, just a final read on from both of you is, um, is this really a scenario where a third party could have made a difference, but the the right people didn't come up and therefore we're stuck with these two awful candidates? Um John, what, yeah, what's your take? I think that's a great counterfactual. I mean, I, I can imagine a world where no labels uh, or some other entity recruited a high-profile candidate very early on, and that would have put, if nothing else, that would have put tremendous pressure on the Democrats, I think, to decide whether they were really going to stick with Biden. Um, but uh, I think it would have taken something like that, a very big name getting in the race at a pretty early point. Um, and, and someone who could conceivably draw from both parties. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there was obviously talk about um, Joe Manchin or uh, Mitt Romney or someone like that. Larry Hogan. Yeah, right, Larry Hogan uh, jumping in. I think, uh, um, you know, any of those potentially could have made a difference, but I think it would have had to happen early on. Mm-hmm. And I think at this point, I think the electorate's pretty resigned to the fact that it's a it's a Trump-Biden choice. Um or if they're not resigned to it, I think they're going to be resigned to it very soon. Um, so it's a little late in the game at this point, but I can't imagine a situation where it would have mattered. Uh, last word, Mike. Well, last word. I, the uh, you know, I, we didn't have somebody that would had a Trumpish political profile, like, you know, liberal on culture, on economics, uh, conservative on cultural issues. I think that would have been a strong if you could have found. Uh, hypothetical candidate, a third candidate like that, uh, it might have been successful. I'm not sure that person could have gotten the no labels uh, label. Uh, If you had a 52-year-old Joe Lieberman instead of an 82-year-old Joe Lieberman, uh, that's another possibility, a different possibility uh, that might have come up. But, uh, you know, the supply of billionaires who are very well known and who are eligible for the office, uh, Elon Musk, uh, having been born and not a U.S. national, but in South Africa national, 
uh, not being eligible. Um, limits uh, the range of things. And uh, I think that, uh, again, uh, it depends on, I, you know, does a, does a third party, uh, we can envisage a scenario where a third party candidate seems to deprive one of the major party candidates of the, the critical electoral votes. Ralph Nader in Florida, 2000, even though it gets a small percentage of the vote. Um, but to see a greater success by a third party candidate, I think it depends on some uh, deteriorate, some uh, probably something in the nature of a health related unhappy event uh, occurring with the one or both of the two party, ca- uh, the major party candidates. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, uh, it is just a matter of. Uh, civic consciousness, that's not something that's really happened um, before uh, in American history. And uh, we, I think for a variety of reasons, we all hope that that does not happen again. So um, we shall see. Well, and I wonder how this will all play out. We'll, we'll know within the next few months. And uh, at the moment, what, what I'm summing up and hearing from both of you is that we're looking at uh, at a classic uh, two party race, not a third party race. And 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 of course the the tragedy in some senses is I think as John mentioned, had you had a Larry Hogan in the race early on, that might have been a game changer. But for whatever reason, our political system seems to to function to just you know vomit up the worst possible um, alternatives. Yeah. Well, as this plays out, we hope you stay tuned to the points of view that we've expressed here. Mike, thank you very much. John, thank you. And thank you for tuning in to the Feudal Future podcast. The Feudal Future.